Welcome to the We Are Libertarians debate series. I got Ryan Lindsay here. I got Spike Cohen here. Uh, we are going to be debating today. It's an Oxford style debate. And the statement is, private police would be as bad or worse than public police. For the affirmative to that statement, we've got Ryan Lindsay. He is the editor of the, uh, the Heretic. It is We Are Libertarians quarterly journal. If you haven't signed up for it, you should. And then... Um, and then we have Spike Cohen for the, for the negative on that. And he is the vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party uh, yeah, candidate. And he is the host of My Fellow Americans. Please subscribe to his channel. Check it out. Both of them do great work. Be sure to follow them along. I'm sure they would be best of friends, but today they are mortal enemies when it comes to this specific statement. And they're going to show why in just a second. So... For Oxford style debates, I've given them each 15 minutes to prepare opening statements, 15 minutes each. Ryan, we will start with you with the affirmative. Why would private police be as bad or worse than public police? Awesome. Well, first off, thank you, Hody, for hosting this. I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to learning a lot, hopefully. Um, so I'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, so the idea of privatizing police addresses the issue of how police are funded, but it fails to address the plethora of systemic and foundational issues that are inherent with the policing profession. Uh, police exist to enforce the will of the state. This is a fundamentally different vocation than simply providing security. Rather than being a reactive role to respond to aggression, policing is a proactive role that initiates aggression. Just changing the way that police are funded doesn't do anything to change that. Policing is an inherently violent and aggressive occupation, whether carried out by a private or public organization. And just changing the way that police are funded, again, doesn't change that. Uh, the demand for policing goes hand in hand with the demand for over-criminalization and a mass penal system. Just changing the way that police are funded, again, doesn't do anything to change that. We can imagine privatized police in two environments. Uh, one would be a privatized police force operating in a nation state framework, like what we live in now. The other environment would be a fully privatized anarcho-capitalist type society. In this first environment, privatized police are and would be contractors hired by the state. This private public arrangement may lead to a temporary decrease in uh, cost, but ultimately, as with almost all private public hybrids, it would result in more corruption and cronyism without solving the underlying issues of policing. In the anarcho-capitalist type environment, in a fully privatized society, the claim is that police would be contractors hi hired by private individuals and groups, which would eliminate or at least reduce the potential for corruption and cronyism that comes with getting in bed with the state. Even if that assumption was true, the premise is still flawed because in a fully privatized stateless society, police wouldn't be needed given that the role of police is to enforce the will of the state. Aside from my concerns with the inability of privatization to actually have a positive impact on the foundational problems of policing, I also believe that history is on my side when I make the claim that privatized policing would not be an improvement over the current system of public police. Take, for example, the notorious Pinkertons. This 19th century privatized policing group did some good work, just like public police do now. They were also, more often than not, though, the jackboot enforcers for robber barons and the paramilitary wing of big businesses. The Pinkertons were regularly hired by elites to spy on unions and to violently break strikes. The 1892 Homestead strike is a great example of this. From the early 1900s onward, though, there's a clear trend line showing the downward correlation of the Pinkertons' collaboration with anti-labor businessmen and the agency's profits. Predictably, Corporate interests sided with corporate interest, and the Pinkertons became a less and less viable model for private policing once they gave up strike breaking and enforcing anti labor laws. Nowadays, the Pinkertons still exist actually under a new name, Securitas Security Services USA, uh, and they, but they've given up all of their policing roles. 
they largely rely on executive protection, risk management, and active shooter response training for their income. So in order to maintain themselves as a profitable private entity, they had to give up their policing functions. Another example of privatized policing going further back in history would be the Santa Imanda from medieval Spain. This was a group of knights and soldiers unaffiliated with any Spanish king or government. They were initially funded through their own personal fortunes in the Catholic Church. They protected Christian pilgrims from Moorish raiders and villages from outlaw gangs led by disgraced knights. This all sounds relatively good, especially for the medieval era. Unfortunately, the Santa Imanda and various states eventually came into conflict with each other. After all, it is the nature of those with power, whether that's public or private power, to challenge others with power. In some areas of Spain, the Imanda were victorious and essentially replaced the state. In most areas, though, the knights capitulated to the kings and reforged their order around maintaining the king's sovereignty. The Imanda gradually became more and more reliant upon taxation for support and, like the later Pinkertons I already went over, became little more than violent enforcers for the Spanish elite. Uh, a final example from history I'll discuss now is that of the early public police forces in American cities in the 1800s. These urban forces essentially evolved out of the privatized policing groups who had been performing policing services for the rich and politically powerful in New York, Boston, Washington, and other American cities for decades. When they gradually became a public force, the municipal governments essentially bought them out and started paying them relatively lucrative salaries. Uh, very little else about the way that those forces operated changed though. Soon, however, the takeover of these police forces made those municipal governments vulnerable to extensive lawsuits and citizen complaints. See, the police were continuing to operate just as they had before they were public, which included charging ransom for recovered goods and even missing persons, operating protection rackets, and taking plentiful bribes from unsavory actors. Once they were public, the cities were forced to at least pretend to address these issues, and it can't be ignored that all of these corrupt behaviors were started and flourished within a privatized policing system. The Pinkertons, Imanda, and early American urban police are just three examples, but the trend of private police groups being used by the mighty against the weak continues across many other similar groups. These groups have a troubling tendency to become what essentially amounts to an organized crime racket to a mob. After all, what really is the difference between mob thugs and the police other than the source of their authority? Aren't mob enforcers essentially just an especially egregious form of privatized police? They are privately funded and rather than simply providing security for their employers and contractees, they enforce the, the rules and whims, i.e. laws, of their respective mobs, i.e. illegitimate quasi-states. Of course, there's the argument that different private police forces would compete for popularity by enforcing various sets of laws. While this would probably be true in the framework of a totally privatized society, I don't think it bears any resemblance to how private police would operate within our current statist framework. Private police organizations contracted by the state would not be able to pick and choose what laws they enforced or ignored. If they did so, they would quickly lose their contracts and licenses to operate in a police capacity. Even in a stateless, fully privatized society, this idea of different police forces competing to be popular falls flat. What about the millions of people who would live in areas with just one or two choices of police force? What about areas where what was unpopular or what was popular included awful things like police brutality, draconian drug laws, racist stop and frisk esque policies, etc. Competing for the popular will in no way guarantees a more libertarian, a more peaceful form of policing. And if the popular will was such that most private forces would never even consider enforcing anti humane, anti libertarian policies, then I'd say that that society has evolved to such a high level that the role of policing is no longer necessary at all. Furthermore, I fear that the various privatized policing forces would be less inclined to compete against each other than to collude and collaborate, collaborate to cartelize their industry. 
Uh, again, it's important to distinguish between security forces like security guards, neighborhood watch, etc., and police. Just as the profession of security guard is dependent on threats to security existing, the profession of police is dependent on threats to the state's authority existing. The state manufactures threats to its authority in order to justify a police state, and I see zero reason to believe that private police organizations would not do the same in order to maintain and grow their profits. States regularly create arbitrary, complicated, and overly penal legal environments in order to justify a police state. Private police organizations would be, and have been, no different. At the end of the day, the only loyalty of private, for-profit industries is to their bottom line. Actually trying to reduce crimes and threats against civic order would be the opposite of profitable. Actually trying to eliminate these threats, even less profitable in the long term. Sure, private organizations would address some crime, just as public police do now, but just enough to justify their existence and demand their growth. In fact, I imagine that private police would just lead to more corruption, as these private organizations flooded lobbyists into everywhere from city halls across America to the White House, demanding and bribing for more subsidies, more laws to enforce, more prisons to fill, etc. I imagine that private police would do their absolute best to disrupt drug legalization efforts, just as the Pinkertons used to disrupt labor movements. That would be profitable after all. I imagine that private police organizations and private prisons would collude to drive up recidivism and expand the number of prisons. That would be profitable. I imagine that private police organizations would intensify and focus their efforts on already over-policed, high population density urban areas, that would be most profitable. Ask yourself, would profit motivate police groups to support or oppose efforts that strike at the roots of crime, the very cancer that justifies said group's existence in the first place? Would profit motivate private police groups to support or oppose movements that take aim and swing at massive wealth inequalities, racial prejudice, endemic poverty, deteriorating family structures, persistent desperation, and any and every other societal factor that leads to crime? I think the answer is clearly no. Why would they? Policing as a profession, profession has a survival instinct to automatically and viciously oppose serious efforts to destroy or even limit the systemic causes of crime. Once again, privatizing police merely changes the funding model of the profession, but it does nothing to solve the problem. I imagine that criminal justice reform gains would slow down tremendously. Almost all the gains we've made on that frontier have been, and this is going to be unpopular among libertarians, but those gains have been eventually because the government realized that their draconian laws were becoming less and less popular with the public. Even though they don't really care that much about what we think or want, the politicians' re-elections are at least still somewhat dependent on their popularity. Private policing organizations wouldn't need to care about popularity, though. Popularity wouldn't motivate them. Profit would. And no, the latter is not tied to the former, or at least not dependent on the former. All private, for-profit businesses want to see their markets expand, their potential for profit grow. This applies just as much to private police organizations as it does to Walmart or Amazon or Chase or Exxon. Unfortunately, the market of private policing is not to provide goods and services to us, it's to enforce the rules, the legal structure around us. In their desire to expand their markets, these private police organizations would have to expand these rules. They'd have to expand the legal structures that surround us and bind us. Is there any reason why a for-profit police organization would want there to be less crime and fewer criminals? I don't think so. And of course, there's the issue of who would pay for private police and how would those who are unable to pay be treated in this system? I'm not going to go so far as to say that the poor uh, would have no police services available to them or that private police couldn't be funded through collective pools like an HOA or a similar model. That being said, it seems clear to me that the elites of society, the rich, the well-connected, the powerful, would have access to far better police than the rest of us. Now, arguably, this is the case now as well, but it seems clear to me that if anything, privatizing police 
would merely uh, make this problem larger. There is, of course, the libertarian argument that people should be able to pay for goods and services uh, as they can afford them. Um, and of course, no one should use force to make sure that such transactions don't occur. But there's also the moral argument that however much money you have should not impact your access to services that are meant to serve the public good. I don't see how a two-tier policing system can be morally justified. Policing and the security that it does to an extent provide is not a consumer or lifestyle issue, and it shouldn't be the exclusive domain of the wealthy and powerful. As I've tried to make abundantly clear here, policing is a fundamentally flawed profession that inherently gears itself towards authoritarianism and has a vested interest rooted in maintaining the existence of threats to the state and to the public. And if no such threats legitimately exist, the profession will help to manufacture them. Privatizing police does nothing, nothing to change that. It merely changes how said police are funded. It's the equivalent of a lung cancer patient switching from menthols to American spirit cigarettes. One might be clearly better than the other, but both perpetuate the problem that is doing great harm to our society. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, uh, Ryan. And we are going to give 15 minutes to Spike Cohen. Spike, why wouldn't private police be as bad or worse than the public police? Well, guys, unfortunately, I think we may have a situation where Ryan and I are going to agree uh, more than we disagree. So I'll get to work here. So guys, I will try my best to get through this as quickly as possible because I value your time almost as much as I value my own. And also because after I finish, Hody's going to announce that he's giving away a brand new Nintendo Switch, but only if I win. In order to get into the specifics of why I support a privatized system of security and policing, let me first talk about why I'm a libertarian so that we're on the same page here. I believe that we own ourselves, our lives, our bodies, our labor, and uh, the product of our labor our property. I believe that our self-ownership is manifest, that we have an inherent claim to the exclusive use and enjoyment of these things. I believe that these are our, our rights and that therefore no one should be able to take any of these things from us in whole or part without our consent. I believe that even if the people who try to take from us call themselves the government and sign sheets of paper claiming some kind of authority that they've granted themselves to take from us and put shiny pieces of metal on other people and order them to take it from us, they still have no right or justification to do so. Once you strip away the pretense and the pageantry from their actions, the made up titles, the oaths, the flags, the pledges, and so on, you are left with people whose actions are no different from that of any other violent, thieving sociopath. I believe that the claims of these violent, thieving sociopaths who call themselves the state, that they provide us a necessary service and that we simply couldn't function as a society without them is laughably false. Not only is the state immoral, it's also inefficient at best and malfeasant at worst by its very nature. Every day we hear terrible stories of immorality, such as the execution last month of Nathaniel Woods, a man who was essentially sentenced to death for swearing at police officers. We hear terrible stories of ineptitude, such as the Centers for Disease Control barring healthcare providers from testing people for the COVID-19 coronavirus for the first six weeks of the outbreak here in the US, which prevented us from being able to contain it and will lead to countless deaths as a result, not to mention the near total shutdown of the country to overcorrect and try to, try to contain it further. If you're watching this show, I probably don't need to tell you that government is a terrible way to do things. And that extends to all government, including their police. The data shows us that government policing is inequitable and downright harmful to public safety. According to the ACLU, people of color are almost four times as likely to be arrested on drug charges as their white counterparts, despite similar rates of drug use. According to the National Academies of Science, people of color are almost three times as likely to be killed by police as whites, despite having similar rates of resisting arrest. We know from countless studies that the poor are overwhelmingly the most likely to serve jail time for extremely petty offenses, such as littering and jaywalking, simply because they're unable to afford the fine for it. And according to the New York City Police Department's own data, 
their police slowdown in 2017 when they intentionally responded to fewer calls and generally made themselves less available to the public actually resulted in a reduction in violent crime. So all of government sucks, including the police. And like Ryan was saying, even if the police are private, meaning that they're paid out of pocket, if they're working within the government state framework, they're still the damn police and they still suck. So we're going to agree on that. Uh, now, since we currently live in a state of society and have never experienced anything different ourselves personally, some of you may be asking, but without violent thieving sociopaths ruling over us, who's going to keep us safe? Well, I'm almost at the point of explaining that because I have to talk for 15 minutes. From both a moral and utilitarian standpoint, a society that is guided by voluntary interactions and respect for the self-ownership and property rights of everyone is vastly superior. Not only is it inherently moral, it also works better because it's driven by the actual needs of the people who are seeking out the solutions rather than by the orders of people who are making you pay for it and exempting themselves from their own orders anyway. Simply put, you're going to get better solutions from people who have an interest in giving you the best service possible than from someone who presumes the authority to tell you what to do and has zero incentive to do right by you. It also has a tendency to prevent monopolies and centralization of power because without the coercive power of the state, people and organizations can only become wealthy and influential by providing value to the market, to all of us, rather than simply by making connections within the state and becoming rent-seeking cronies who provide no real value other than to help keep the state and its, uh, and its enforcement propped up. In short, you're going to get better services from someone who doesn't have a gun to your head. And that brings us to policing. In any society, there are going to be people who victimize others, whether out of a malicious nature or just out of desperation. There will always be thieves, murderers, rapists, abusers, and the like. And as people who own ourselves and our property, we all have the right not to be harmed or robbed. So then in any just and civilized society, there will need to be some need. Uh, there will be some need to enforce our rights and safety against those who would harm us. And while many of us may be in a position to enforce that ourselves directly, many of us aren't. Many of us aren't able to effectively deter, deter people from victimizing us. And so any community, a voluntary community, a status community, any community is going to have some demand for the service of protecting and enforcing our rights and our property and our lives against aggressors. Uh, and I believe that that enforcement can be met by private or community, uh, if you prefer to say that, police services and security services. The objections to this model typically fall under these two main questions. Question number one goes something like this. In a system of privatized policing, how can people who aren't wealthy afford to get the same access to policing services as the wealthy if they aren't free to the public as they are now? Of course, we know those services aren't free. They're paid for out of taxes. And without going into another 15-minute speech about taxes, and God help me, I'll do it, all taxes end up becoming the burden of those with the least. Because any tax on the wealthy or on corporations is simply added to the price of the goods and services that they, uh, uh, to the price of the goods and services that they sell and rent, which is paid by the consumer, which means that the higher of a, of a percentage of your income that is spent on buying and renting basic goods and services, the higher of a de facto tax rate that you're paying. In this way, all taxation is inherently regressive, and therefore any system that eliminates the publicly funded tax model in favor of a privately funded voluntary fee model inherently benefits those with the least. And unlike in our current system, where power and wealth is centralized and therefore the police will always disproportionately enforce its laws against the poor and marginalized to the benefit of the wealthy and the powerful, in a voluntary stateless society where power is decentralized, the greatest public need will be to ensure peace by defending against violence, aggression, and coercion. People of various income levels, including those with the least, will be able to voluntarily pool their resources to come up with community policing solutions, either through the creation of mutual protection networks where neighbors look out for each other, the hiring of professional security or policing services, or more than likely, some combination of those. And because they're not mandated by law to police themselves in a way that may not benefit them, they'll be able to easily custom tailor their solutions to meet their needs in the best way for them. They're not going to create a bunch of laws just for the sake of having laws to enforce and prisons to fill when it's them that will be having to pay for it directly, both with their money and their lives. 
Question number two is also a great one. What stops a private police force from becoming a de facto government over time? This speaks to an eternal debate between anarchists and everyone else, which we will probably be delving into shortly as to whether or not a voluntary society can remain voluntary and sustain itself, or whether it will always end up reverting back to our current status quo, where we are ruled over by warlords who rob us of our property, our rights, and our dignity to the benefit of themselves and their favored cronies. Well, I certainly hope that doesn't happen. Thank you. No, listen, in any attempt to organize a society voluntarily and without coercion, there will always be a need to be vigilant against attempts to centralize power and force everyone into subservience. But by already having decentralized things to the point where even our most basic services, such as policing and security, are met by voluntary contract, we will have already created a pretty high hurdle to climb for anyone who is attempting to create a new state. They're not simply taking over an existing state. They're having to create a new one from scratch amongst a population that has already demonstrated that it wants no such thing. And again, because these voluntary, decentralized communities are the ones directly deciding the types of services they want, and limiting, limiting it only to the defense of rights and property without any greater political aims, there is very little potential for the kind of mission creep that turns voluntary solutions into forced solutions in our current status quo society, like the examples that Ryan was giving. And because we are paying for it directly, instead of essentially being robbed at gunpoint to pay for it, there's little risk to the growth of a police prison complex or a war on drugs or any of the other taxpayer-funded boondoggles that the state creates as an excuse to give tax dollars to their favored cronies. We're paying directly, we don't want those things, and so we won't pay for them. So I know we're about to chop it up further in discussion about this subject, and I hope to win this debate because I take losing very poorly. So I'll end with this. We own ourselves, but we are not islands. We are social primates, and we are designed to interact with one another in a societal format. And I believe that the most moral and effective way for us to interact in societal formats is voluntarily. And for the best way for us to get services that we need is in, is in a voluntary way. And that includes service of the service of security and of protection. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for preparing those statements, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up the debate between the both of you now. Ryan, okay. did you just hear Spike say anything that you uh, disagree with? You all are free to have a conversation for the next... Uh, 15 minutes or so, and I'll, I'll add in a couple questions of my own. Yeah, um, well, uh, thank you, Spike. That was, uh, that was really informative. Um, you raised a lot of great points. Um, I think the, the, off the top of my head, the main thing that stands out to me is something I disagree with is, okay. um, I guess, your, uh, your belief that, like you said, mission creep wouldn't happen. Um, and, and I get that if we're viewing policing as, you know, like me and my neighbors all agree, like, Hey, you know, I'll take this, this, and this night every month and, you know, keep an eye out on things, make sure, you know, no shenanigans are going down in the neighborhood. Right. Um, that makes sense. But if we're talking about, uh, you know, you have like, if Walmart decides I'm, you know, Walmart's going to hire 500 security police people for each store, um, you know, what's going to keep them from going from, uh, okay, our only goal is to prevent shoplifting to now our goal is to prevent uh, people from jaywalking across our parking lot to our goal is to prevent people from smoking in our parking lots, um, you know, and just gradually taking on more and more rules to enforce, um, you know, and what happens whenever because, you know, like Walmart, even that's a company, they have their own bank. And so, you know, oh, this person is late on their loan. Are we going to get Walmart police showing up at our door to, uh, you know, collect payment? Right. Um, I, I think whenever you get into the realm of like the larger corporations, um, I think the potential for mission creep increases exponentially um, as compared to like more community based neighborhood uh, policing. Yeah, and, and I agree. And I think for the sake of this discussion, um, we're probably going to find that if we're talking about within the confines of our current status quo society, we probably agree 100% on, yeah. on the nature of how that's going to work. So specifically talking about in a, in a post-state, a voluntary society, um, I think, first of all, I think the scenarios that you've raised are what would happen. And I also think that if those 
corporations continue to exist. I don't think in a truly voluntary, non-coercive society, you're going to have organizations that are able to grow that big without remaining at least humble enough to be able to be providing a great value that is synonymous with the amount of, of, of wealth that they're getting as a result. So a Walmart right now, if you look at Walmart and we, it, you know, this is very unfortunate when a lot of and caps and just libertarians in general find themselves defending Walmart and Amazon um, because these are organizations that started off very well. They were small organizations that became very big because of providing tremendous amounts of value, revolutionizing entire ways that we, we function as a society and, and giving us continued great benefits. They at some point reach a point where the only way that they can grow or even maintain their level of wealth is to essentially glom onto the state and become a functionary of the state. So you have Walmart, when they open a Walmart, first they make sure that the taxpayer is going to pay for the roads around the creation of the new Walmart and make sure that the police routes are going to come through so that you know they're externalizing their security costs to the state. All of these things happen because they are making sure to leverage the state to keep themselves as, as a, you know, one of the prime movers in that market and keep competitors uh, as low as possible. We're seeing now with the whole, you know, Walmart and Amazon are pushing for minimum wage increases, not the kind that the labor rights people want, but just high enough to knock out most of their mom and pop competition who can't afford it. Another perfect example of them pretending to be in our best interest, but really just glomming onto the state. I don't know that a Walmart in the configuration that we know it as would even exist. And the only way it could exist is if its level of, of service to the community was such that it simply made sense to, for it to have that level of wealth. I think you would see, when I say decentralization, and, and again, this is where a lot of ANCAPs get tripped up here, a decentralized society is going to be a decentralized society. You're not going to see in a truly non-coercive society, you're not going to see something be able to grow to the level of an Amazon and remain there and get bigger and bigger and bigger because it doesn't have a state to enforce it as a, as a de facto monopoly or even as a, a dominator of the market. So there's going to be constant churn of, of new competing services. And that would not just be in the policing, but in those examples you gave. So for example, if a grocery store chain that was larger uh, you know, because I mean, it's not to say that there can't still be large companies and things like that. But if a larger chain started really having enough mission creep that it was, you know, arresting people in their homes for not paying their Mick loans off, then you're going to start seeing enough pushback from people saying, hey, you know what, I'll pay a little extra for bread to not get arrested at home because, you know, I was a few days late on a payment. Like if they, if they go past a certain point where they're no longer, you know, just enforcing, you know, security on their lot or, you know, making sure that people aren't harassing people in the parking lot or making sure that the people that are there are actually there to shop or whatever, which is their right on their property. Uh, if they start actually going into, you know, enforcing themselves outside of their domain and creeping and creeping further and further into our lives, there's going to be a natural pushback and it doesn't have to be a violent one. It can simply be us saying, yeah, I'm never going to go back there again and telling other people about that. And, you know, you know, basically the, 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 I guess, voluntary society version of Yelp or, you know, urban, uh, urban spoon and all these different things where we say, you know, listen, uh, and, and social media where we say, Hey, listen, you know, these people are turning into that thing we didn't like. Um, so I think that there's a natural pushback that's going to happen. And I don't think any, I'm not going to defend any human set of interaction as being utopian in nature, because it's not going to be. Um, it, 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 there are going to be people who are going to try to attempt. I mean, the whole reason we're even talking about the need for policing and security of any kind is precisely because there's always going to be people trying to aggress. There's always going to be people trying to get ahead at the expense of someone else in, instead of in cooperation and competition with someone else. So there's going to have to always be that, that kind of vigilance to make sure that, you know, Walmart isn't becoming, you know, the, the, the Republic of Walmart. Um, but I think that will be easier when you don't have a state that it can use as its enforcement mechanism. Okay. Yeah, no, that, um, thank you for that clarification. Um, and I, I definitely agree that uh, I like how whenever you say decentralized, you actually mean decentralized. I hear actual decentralized, right. Yeah. A lot of ANCAPs talk about a stateless society, but really all they mean is that instead of Washington, D.C., you know, it's Bentonville, Arkansas, and Sam Walton's descendants making all the decisions. So, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's enough hating on ANCAPs, you two. Uh, 
I promised a debate today and I'm going to have a debate today because I am an anarcho-capitalist. So let's go ahead. And uh, if you're not going to debate each other, you're going to debate me. Well, see, I'm so, an ANCAP, but I, I, I am an ANCAP, but I, I believe that. And I think, Cody, you probably agree with me. We're oh, probably, I, do, we're, I do. We're all going to end up agreeing with each other, damn it. I, 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 I actually, um, I am going to disagree with you in, in this aspect. And I will okay. say this, that even, uh, I would contend that even in the current framework of the current system, that a private police force is better than a public police force. I simply am just going to give you some statistics and I'd like for you guys to tell me what you think of these statistics. We have I'm not very debating you. <laughs> we have very, we have very few. Well, the, part of the Oxford we format is friendly. taking a, taking questions from the forum, and I'm the only guy on the forum, so you get my questions. Uh, there are very few districts that actually have private police, but we actually do have some that have private police here in the United States. Um, among them, when they went to private police force. They halved their call times in response to 911 emergency calls. They virtually eliminated all their victimless traffic crime tickets. Mm -hmm. They went from a 30 year wait time on their rape kits to a three week time on processing rape kits. And uh, the Warren decision applies to public police and says that public police have no uh, no obligation to defend their constituents. However, right. private police were ruled that they do have an obligation to protect their constituents. Yes. With that information, both of you, would you please defend why pu private police are worse than public police or as bad or worse? So let me as the it, Ryan, are you OK with me starting since I'm ostensibly the pro the pro public police side on this? Yeah, no, go pro for private it. pro private police. <laughs> so I, I want to say. I, I didn't want to defend private police within the statist model uh, for, for a variety of, of moral and, and utilitarian reasons. But I will say any, any competitive model is going to work better than a non-competitive coercive model. So the fact that these cities and municipalities can hire someone else if these folks don't do a, a good enough job. And like you said, we're the Warren decision, which for those who don't know, the Warren decision was in on my birthday in uh, 2005, I think, 2003, where the Supreme Court decided that the police uh, have absolutely zero obligation to actually serve and protect you. Their only job is to enforce the law uh, to the best of their ability. And if you get protected in the course of that, sweet. And if not, also sweet. They're fine with that. Whereas, again, like Hody was saying, in these examples of, of them actually hiring someone, if that's in their job description that they have to protect you, then they can, they can actually be held uh, civilly liable or even possibly criminally liable uh, for neglecting to do so. So there is an improvement of that. The reason I chose not to defend the, the, the model of private policing within the sadist status quo uh, 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 model of, of society is that there is that potential, and, and I, I would say inevitability that over time there will be mission creep because ultimately the the end the, the the payer the client is the state even if it's ostensibly to protect the public the client is still the state and like ryan was saying at the end of the day they are still in service to the state they may do it more efficiently cost wise if if you know initially they came in to process rate kits and you know do general services and things like that then they'll pro they'll they'll do so more efficiently but like ryan was also saying there's also long term the potential that you now have private like in the private prison industry you now have private lobbyists who are pushing for mission creep and increases in laws so that they have more stuff to do in service to the state so yes immediately short term uh, apples to apples comparison uh, the private police are going to be more efficient and and possibly even more equitable in the way that they deliver services no comparison by the simple matter of the fact that they can be fired and replaced with another service who can long term in terms of dealing with the societal reasons that we have problems with between the police and the greater community it doesn't address that because the nature of the problem is directly related to the violent coercive monopoly that presumes authority over all of us which is the state all right, Ryan, you now have an obligation to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, so, we're going to have some disagreement eventually. Here we go. So, um, okay. So some of those stats you're pointing out, um, you know, talking about like the, the lowering of the traffic tickets and faster processing rape kits and um, all that stuff. Uh, so I'd be curious to know, and I don't know if 
you have that data or not, but the, the towns and cities that did that, are we talking like big cities like uh, New York or are we talking like small town rural areas? Uh, they look rural. Oro, okay. Oro Valley, Arizona, uh, yeah. Reminderville, Ohio, Indian Springs, Florida, so Buffalo Creek, makes... West Virginia. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense to me, but I, I would s- my contention is that uh, the betterment in those services, if they're private police forms, private police forces, if they're coming like from those cities and from those towns, um, then they're going to have more of a motivation to, uh, you know, nobody wants to pull over their next door neighbor if they don't absolutely have to. If you're processing a rape kit of somebody that you are, you know, within at least three degrees of separation from, you're probably going to do it a lot faster than if it's just somebody, you know, one out of a million people that lives in your city or area. Um, And likewise, and that's actually, uh, and you could say that, lots of public police live in their areas too, but it's actually very common, especially nowadays because of how unpopular police are for them to actually live quite a ways outside of the areas that they actually, um, you know, patrol or have authority in. Um, And so I would say that those better services probably have more to do with uh, the the community source nature of private, that private police force or those private police forces. Um, And I think that's something that can be mimicked in public police forces, Um, like community policing initiatives, basically like, um, you know, if you want to patrol, like I live in Springfield, if you want to patrol the Northwest side of Springfield, you got to live in the Northwest side of Springfield. And I think even whether public or private, you're going to have better interactions and better relationships with that area. Um, Trying to think. Where else? I had another thought. <laughs> that was my main point for sure, though. That's all right, because I do have one more question. If you, I remember, actually, you I have a rare back. moment. I have Go a ma- rare moment of disagreement with. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I breaking Oxford laws? <laughs> no, you're good. This okay. is open, open forum. You're good. Th- that's what I thought. That's what I yeah. thought I wanted to make sure. So I do have one point of of disagreement with Ryan. There, I do agree. I'm already starting by agreeing again. Uh, I do agree that. <laughs> Ryan, you ignorant slut. No, um, I do. I do agree that um, it's probably best for people to be closest to the community that they're enforcing. Our human nature is that we're going to care more about our immediate community than, you know, somewhere dozens or even you know, hundred plus miles away. Especially if the 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 community makeup there is completely different than our own. It feels like we're going to a almost like a foreign area, and you know, they're distrusting of me that gets mirrored back and forth. So, I mean, I can see how, how being closer is a helpful thing. I will push back a little on, I do think within a private model, at least until the lobbying starts to kick in on, on the, on the, the, the private, you know, profit mode of lobbying side, at least initially. And if you can keep it competitive and, and, and have some churn there uh, between different agencies, uh, there is the potential that just by the nature that they can be fired um, makes for, more of an incentive for them to actually do their job right. I mean, we, we, it, it's not just the police. We know that government work, I mean, we joke about the DMV. We joke about these things because they can't be fired. They have some of the greatest protections for, for, for their employment. And they really have to, I mean, you know, the public police have to be convicted of a serious crime before they get fired. Um, not even like sucking isn't an or, or they have to, you know, actually be a good cop and try to stop bad things from happening. That'll get you fired immediately. Every other time you have to go through like being actually prosecuted, which is, you know, depressingly rare uh, of them being actually prosecuted for their crime. So I, I would say, I do think in that way, I think that there is a way that, that the private police are at least immediately more uh, uh, accountable and, and potentially more uh, efficient, but it, that, that potential for mission creep eventually can actually like, and I agree with you on that, that it can actually end up getting worse because now you have a private entity. We're seeing it in the prison system. The private prisons started off as an efficient way to, to, to house prisoners. It probably still is from a, you know, prisoner to prisoner, you know, cost uh, comparison, but now you've got private entities that are, pub- that are, that are lobbying for these laws uh, ostensibly for the public interest when there is no such thing. We don't want these things. So I, 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 I disagree with both of you in, in, in your own special way. 
No, that's fair. Um, I'll definitely concede that uh, whenever you take into account things like public sector unions and all, um, that definitely really does have a huge impact on the ability to get rid of uh, bad or inefficient actors. Um, definitely. Um, I did just remember my the other point I wanted to bring up about this. Okay. Um, I would say, and, and this might just be a difference in definitions, but I, I think it's important to remember. But if uh, if like these private police in these towns, if they're not actually enforcing the laws and they're just more protecting their neighbors from violent acts and criminals, I don't think we can really accurately call them police. They're security guards at that point. Um, the Supreme Court, if they said like, you know, private police aren't, uh, they don't have to enforce the law, public police do. I don't think, I think whenever they make that decision, really they're just saying that private police like don't necessarily have to actually be police. I think that law enforcement is a fundamental and crucial part of policing. That's, That's uh, fair. That, that is kind of a definitional thing. I will say that uh, in a stateless society, the law, quote unquote, as it were, would essentially be the preservation of human life and, and, and property and rights. Um, so then maybe we could say that policing of the law would just be enforcing of the NAP or whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's fair. So let me give you a pushback on that one as well. Final pushback, and then we'll each turn in, we'll, we'll each uh, finish with our closing statements here. Um, we had anarchy for a little bit. We've had it. We had it in our grasp before. We had the fall of feudalism. And specifically in the UK, and it's very well documented, um, they were held hostage by about 1% of the population that decided to be pirates and steal from everybody else. And the resistance to any type of police force or protection force or organization, even of a voluntary nature of a policing force to watch out for this, the pushback was so strong that eventually the 1% became the government. And now you have what you have. So if private public, if the policing is so bad, what happened in the UK? And what will we do to stop it from happening again? Do you want to take that first, Ryan? Or? You can take that first. <laughs> okay, that's fine. No problem. Um, so I, I would say that, uh, again, I, I think that that underscores, I think I'm winning. Am I winning? Did, is someone, how many points do I, I, I think I have 12 points. We got um, a cheerleader I, with placards that'll come out at the very end that'll. Oh, per, okay. Then that's, yeah. I'll just wait for that. I'll just wait for that. So I, I think this really underscores what, what I was saying. In any society, in order for it to function and not just be taken over by the, you know, Mo warlords, you have to have someone protecting the the general public safety and and public safety in that case would mean these you know voluntary communities perfect example the pirates are able to take over now the pirates are the state because like you said there was pushback on anything that resembled a, a policing authority and I, I think again this is more of a definitional thing if the only laws in a society voluntary or otherwise are you can't kill people you can't beat people you can't rape people you can't you know rob them you can't defraud them and things like that you can't trespass on their property you can't if those are the only laws quote unquote that are in place in a society um which i don't think would be the case in a statist one because that it, it doesn't allow them to, to function the way they need to but if we live in a society where those are the only laws and the people that are enforcing those are the de facto police and essentially all they're doing uh, is making sure that we are safe from those things, then I, I would say most people would argue, and I would be one of them, that that is a society that is allowing itself to be free, not just from the centralized violence of the state or the threat of someone centralizing violence and becoming the state, but also from the, the and here we're getting into positive rights, but safe from having someone harm you. Uh, uh, just in a, in a decentralized way, or, 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 or at least somewhat of a, a deterrence of that happening. Um, and if we call that policing, that's, that's fine. Um, so that's why I would say, no, I mean, if we just try to have uh, utopian uh, uh, anarchy where we say, no one's going to hurt us because we're all living voluntary, that's going to fail. And I, and I don't think anyone could seriously propose that. And I, I don't, Ryan, you're not, that, you're not proposing that there's no enforcement or, or protection against those that would try to harm, correct? I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to put words in your mouth. Uh, I'm I'm actually a pacifist, so. <laughs> okay. 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 So then, so then this here here's a thing we can disagree on, Ryan. <laughs> yes. So, 
I am not a violent person. I do not like violence. I think pacifism is an absolute, God, I'm doing it again. I'm agreeing with you. Uh, I, I, I think that is a very noble thing. I do think that there are people who will always try to, uh, that will always try to take advantage of that whether you're a part pacifist or they're just in a position to try to harm you. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, we always go to like someone going to beat you up or someone's going to, you know, try to kill you or whatever, defrauding you, uh, uh, trying to steal your identity, that kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be like a, a violent physical aggression, any kind of aggression against your, your body, your life, your property, your, 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 your money, your rights and all and so forth is, is an act of aggression. And, and unfortunately I think, it is a, in the same way that anarchy is a laudable and attainable, a, a laudable goal to always be pushing towards to, to hopefully achieve. I think pa pacifism is similarly a, a laudable goal for us to try to do, to be as passive as possible, to find nonviolent solutions. But I do believe that because of our inherent nature as social primates, that there's always going to be at least someone who's going to try to push back against that. And that that's why, even if it's again, you know, neighborhood enforcement or some kind of level of community security, policing, whatever word we want to use for it, to have someone there, the so-called, you know, rough men who protect us at night or whatever, that, that are doing basic level of protection. But with the idea that that's all we want them to do. And it's a very specific and clearly defined thing that it's not, oh, protect the public from, you know, uh, from, you know, someone, uh, uh, you know, smoking a joint or, or you know, uh, starting a business without a license or, or even having licenses to begin with, but harming other people. Um, so I guess we, we can disagree on that just because I'm not a pacifist. But I also think like the more of us were pacifists, probably the better it would be um, just by definition. But I, I also think that the reality is that even if we live passively or, or peacefully, I should say, in, in how we conduct ourselves, I think we should always be mindful and vigilant of the fact that there are some people that, that might actually take advantage of that, even if it's not in a violent way, just to defraud you or something like that. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, and uh, I, I agree with what you said that uh, anarchy, a stateless society, um, and pacifism, those are both very aspirational goals. Um, you know, personally, I don't, I don't know if they're, they're realistic at all. It's just something yeah. like this is a general, this is a general target we're aiming for and whatever we can do to get closer to those things is good. Right. Um, I would, I think for me, uh, and this is a lot to do with just my personal convictions and beliefs, but for me, the two go hand in hand. Um, if you don't have a gradual decline in statism, uh, along with a gradual decline in our collective societal um, willingness to use violence on each other, then I think that the the growth towards anarchy will naturally decline. Um, yeah, I absolutely. think you have to have the two go hand in hand. And so I, I would say a society where, uh, you know, like you were saying, where the only law is don't hurt people, don't take their stuff to right. quote, Matt Kibbe, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that's where that's the only law, um, then that's basically a stateless society. And it's hard for me to imagine that society existing stably for a long period of time and also needing um, a group of basically private security to enforce or protect that law. Um, it seems like if you have that stateless society where that is like the only understood rule, I guess, um, then it, it, like society has advanced to such a point where you don't, it doesn't need to be enforced regularly, if at all. Um, Oh, they're definitely, I mean, we're not going to have a police state to enforce it. I think, I think in, in general, where we're talking about decentralizing the ability to project violence, I think that also inherently means that the need to enforce against it's going to be much smaller. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's not to say that there's not going to be anyone with guns going around trying to protect people, but I, I don't think you're going to naturally need that. Um, but like, you know, with Hody's example, if you even have 1% or a, a fraction of a percent trying, if no one is 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 pushing back, it's very easy for that one percent. Look at our look at our current government. Uh, we have something like uh, I think it's uh, and Hody, you probably you might have the numbers in front of you, but I want to say we have something like two or three million police officers total. So you're looking at about one percent of the population that is enforcing the will of a fraction of a percent of the population against us. Um, so in theory, even in a post-state society, 
a very small fraction of the members of that society if there was no one trying to keep that 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 potential that 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 primal nature that many of us have to try to control others in check uh then it could be easy for them to rise up but i mean yeah i mean people will ask me, do you think anarchy is an achievable, sustainable thing? And I say, I have no idea. I just know it to be the only moral and consistent and efficient framework that I feel comfortable proposing. And I think that at the very least, we need to be moving, stop moving in the direction opposite to that and start moving in the direction towards that. Uh, And wherever we get, that's why, you know, I have no problem teaming up with with, you know, minarchist and constitutionalists and, and small government types, um, on, at least on, on the issues that we agree on, or with anarcho-communists and anarcho-syndicalists and anarcho-mutualists and, and every, you know, across the panarchy spectrum, you know, because we're all agreeing that we need to go way towards that way. And as we get, if we actually ever get close to that, then we can start having, you know, more uh, spirited debates on, you know, where exactly we need to stop, if at all. But I, I think if we're talking in the abstract, that yeah, a, 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 a voluntary society is going to naturally be a more peaceful society and whatever layer or filter of deterrence of, of, of aggression, violent or nonviolent aggression uh, is, is going to be obviously less necessary as a result. But I, I do believe it will still be there to some extent. I will thank you both for your time and you each get five minutes to bid every up to five minutes to bid everybody adieu. By the way, Spike, I whipped out my calculator real quick. 850,000 law enforcement officers across That's the United it? States. That represents 0.2% of the population. Wow. So there you go. Uh, that's law enforcement. That's not military, but there you go. Uh, I, may have, I may have been including military in that because I know it's like a 2 million number, but that's wow. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Based on a very quick Google search and perhaps my bad math. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think we both agree I won the debate, but you each get five minutes to try. <laughs> you each get five minutes to try to prove that wrong. So Ryan, go ahead, buddy. Yeah. So uh, thanks again, Hody, for putting this on. This was a lot of fun. Um, Spike, thank you for uh, participating with me. Um, you made me think about a whole lot of stuff. Uh, you had some really informative, um, thoughtful things to say. So I appreciate that. Um, and I think, uh, and this is going to be restating some of what I opened with and talked about during the debate, but I, I think um, fundamentally that uh, I, I believe in the axiom that power corrupts, and that includes private power um, just as much as it does public power. And I think, you know, like like Spike mentioned, you have two million two million law enforcement and military uh, personnel controlling a country of 330 million people. Um, but they're able to do that because they're not against the will of all 330 million of those people. Um, lots of us have been demagogued into, uh, you know, believing in the laws they support. And that demagoguery, I don't think, is uh, un, unbreakably linked to the state. I think the state is just the tool that demagogues use um, to gain control. But I think that demagogues could just as easily use uh, a private avenues to manipulate public opinion um, into supporting letting p- private police forces uh, or security services um, be used in a, a mission creep way to gradually expand their power uh, and be no better than the public police we have now. Um, I, I do, I, I will concede again the point that, uh, especially whenever you factor in um, public sector unions. Uh, there is a argue, there's definitely a more immediate short term at least accountability with private police forces um, and that is important but I, I don't think it's uh, a good enough gain to offset the other negative or non-existent um, uh, harms and non-existent benefits of private policing um, and so again, and I don't want anything that I said here to be taken as a defense of uh, public policing either. I think that profession is just as bad and should be shrunk or done away with um, either of those orders. Um, but I, I just am trying to say that uh, private policing, I think it doesn't do enough to address the core issues with policing that make the profession um, so geared towards authoritarianism um, 
and aggression. Uh, and especially if it is a largely for-profit, um, profit-driven private policing group, uh, I don't see how a group like that wouldn't eventually uh, try to expand their markets by uh, you know, using demography or other tactics to create uh, more law, more laws, um, whatever those would look like in, you know, a stateless society. Um, and eventually, to the extent where it wasn't a stateless society anymore. Um, and I'm glad that we could agree that, pri for the most part, that private policing in a uh, in our current status framework um, is probably no bueno. Um, you know, lots of cronyism that comes along with that. Um, so yeah, this was a really fun discussion um, and it's really got my, got my brain going. So thank you both. Oh, of course, buddy. Uh, Spike, five minutes to bring us home, baby. Awesome. So guys, I actually didn't write a, a, a ending speech because I fully expected to have won so, uh, <laughs> a sing so, so overwhelmingly that both Hody and Ryan would just be crying right now. And uh, so that I could just kind of, you know, just comfort them in, in their time of need. So I didn't, I didn't come up with a speech. And so I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll kind of sum up what we were talking about. The thing is, guys, I, I don't want to, I don't want to pander to you. I refuse to pander to you or, or anyone else. And so as someone who, who never panders, I just want to tell you that I think it's very clear uh, that in a, a government model of society, you're going to get bad solutions. And we both, we all three agree on that, except for Hody, who's looking for a reason to disagree with, with one of us for something, please God. Um, but I, here, here's what I want to leave you with. Um, any way that you, anytime you want to get any kind of service, whatever it is, policing, food, housing, whatever, anytime you want to get a, a service, there are essentially two ways you can get that service. One is through uh, in an open market with competing providers who are trying to provide you with the best service uh, so that you will go with them over their competitor, uh, which gives you uh, as much value for your money as is, is possible given the scarcity of the, of the, uh, the, the goods and services in, in question. Uh, and the other is through a monopoly, uh, which doesn't have to give you a good service at all because um, they're the only business in town. And if you need it, you have to pay what you have to pay. Government is a violent monopoly that is financed by theft and that is enforced with threats of anything from kidnapping to further theft to even murder uh, or assault uh, if you don't comply with them. And I think anyone who tells you that the best way that you're going to, uh, to get a provision of service is through an organization like that who essentially has a gun to your head and to the heads of your children uh, and is telling you that you simply have to go with what they say, not just because they'll, they'll hurt you if you don't, but also to try to delegitimize the idea that, you know, to, to gaslight you and tell you that they're providing you with a great service. They're a gaslighting abuser and, and there's no reason to think that you'll get good services from them. Um, I think some of our disagreement tonight was mostly over terms, what is or is not policing in a, in a post-state society. But I think any libertarian thought of self-ownership and non-aggression and voluntarism, ultimately that is going to forcibly lead itself to the reality that the state, what calls itself the state or the government, is an illegitimate organization. It is unfit to exist both from a moral and utilitarian standpoint. And, uh, and whatever solutions look like outside of that, whether we're calling it private uh, 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 security or policing, whether we're calling it private or voluntary, ultimately it boils down to the same thing. Free people who recognize their self-ownership and the self-ownership of those around them who are voluntarily cooperating with each other to come together and find solutions for the types of things that they need. In this case, you know, safety and, and security. Um, and so I just want to thank Hody again, who will never have me on his show uh, because I refuse <laughs> to disagree with people. And uh, I'd like to thank Ryan for, uh, for uh, I guess we'll call that a, a debate. Uh, we, we did some debating. I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm happy that we, it's more of a forum than a debate, I guess. Uh, yeah. But thank you. Thank you for both of you for uh, letting me talk and uh, check me out uh, uh, at Real Spike Cohen uh, on Twitter and uh, uh, facebook.com slash literally spike cohen or uh, if you're searching in the facebook bar spike cohen comma your next vp uh, and if you are a libertarian party delegate i hope to have your support and endorsement for the libertarian party vice presidential nomination whenever we have our convention 
in May go. or if it ends up getting canceled, then <laughs> scheduled for something. Whenever we decide to choose someone, I hope I'm your pick. And guys, subject to you pandemics. Again. Yeah, you bet. Uh, uh, <laughs> Ryan, uh, you want to give them any credentials, any, anything they should check out for you to find you, to get access to whatever you're into? Yeah. Um, well, if you're part of the uh, Walnuts group, you can always find me posting all kinds of heretical content in there. Um, getting some discussion riled up. Uh, and if you want to uh, check out it, um, the, uh, the magazine that I do for Wall, um, you can go to theHereticJournal.com uh, and you can check out all of our past articles. Um, we also have a blog and it's linked on that website, but if you just want to go straight to that, uh, just um, hereticjournal.home.blog. That's uh, our blog and uh, Hody contributes to that. Um, and I, I write a lot on that. So uh, yeah, and we're on Facebook, um, just heretic, search for us there, uh, or Twitter and Instagram at wall underscore heretic. Yeah, it is uh, verified the best libertarian <laughs> quarterly journal verified by me, um, totally unbiased, but yeah, it, it's the best. Uh, Spike Cohen, Thank Ryan Lindsay. Wall Patreons, thank you everybody so much for making this happen. We cannot wait to do the next debate. I appreciate these two very much. Uh, they were very respectful, so please be respectful to them if you find yourself <laughs> wanting debate to debate them based on this debate. You can be disrespectful to me. I can take it, but they're sweet souls. Please be nice to them. Uh, again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and we thank will you. see you next time.